All right, probably get started. Um, so my name is Mac, one of the third years this year. Uh, I gave you guys the HLSD lecture last year. Uh, so this year we'll be going over cardio. Uh, there's a lot of physiology in this that's like good to know, and you might get a couple questions on it, but largely it's going to be more clinical situation -y kind of stuff on the exam. But it's all in there, so, um, and you have a copy of the slides, and I put a copy up of the, um, the one with the questions on it as well afterwards. I'll just give it to Denali or something. So, uh, basically the things we're going to go over today, anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, and clin skills. Um, and in clin skills, that basically just means, like, knowing what all the things you look on in the cardio exam mean, or what the point of asking your questions in the system really is. Because if you know what those are, then you can basically answer every clinical skills question. So, there's a lot of anatomy. Um, we'll probably speed through parts of it because it's not hugely important. This is everyone's favorite up here. Um, you don't need to know a lot of it, but bits and pieces would be nice. So, uh, so just basically, it's one of the first things that you get. Um, it starts in the neck and moves down. Um, and the fact that it forces the precursor to the diaphragm down is part of why you get the um, phrenic nerve innervating it um, for your pain sensation. Uh, and the gut tube's behind it, and then it becomes the esophagus. That's not that important. This bit's kind of important. So uh, in us, you get more pressure on the left side. Ooh. All right, the left side of the heart. Um, and that's because you've got to go to the whole body, whereas the right side is lower. But in utero, because you've got lungs full of fluid, your right side of the heart's going to have higher pressure. And so you've got like three main shunts that your body uses in utero to bypass the lungs. Um, and then each of these gets closed off as you grow up, um, unless something goes wrong, which is where you get things like a patent form and ovale, um, which we'll talk about in a sec. So this is basically all you really need to know. Um, this, actually, no, you do need to know all of this. So the first one, the last one should be pretty easy because you just have to remember arteriosis or venosis because you're going to be able to guess that this is related to this and this is related to this. Um, Really, this part is just memorizing it. It's not that complicated. Uh, chambering, uh, this starts very basic. You've got one in, one out, um, and then that'll split later on. Uh, probably just learn what each of the precursor names are. So sinus venosis for your uh, atrial structures and bulbous cordis for ventricular. And broadly speaking, the atria tend to be posterior and superior, and the ventricles are found anteriorly and inferiorly. So I don't have a picture in this PowerPoint, but you probably had a question at some point where they give you a picture of the gross anatomy of the heart and they point to something and say, what's this? So even if you don't really know, you kind of guess ventricular or atrial based just on broadly where it is. Uh, septation, also kind of gross, but um, in addition to the folding, you're just going to be forming walls between your main one in, one out tracks. Um, and the point of that is to give you your left and right side of circulation later on. Um, so. In the middle, you might remember, and there's some people after this, that you've got two different septa, uh, septa that form. And the point of having a thinner one, the septum primum, is so that it can move out of the way to let you shunt blood from the right side of your heart to the left. And that's important because as we've talked about, you need to be able to skip the lungs because there's no oxygenation happening there. And you need to get oxygenated blood from the mother around to the body. So there's no point going to the lungs. So hopefully, here we go. So, Septum prime, and nobody really cares about the ventricular bit, so don't worry about that. But septum primum starts on the left and grows down towards the endocardial cushion. And so that's this step here. And then once it gets all the way down, ostium primum, which is the gap that was left here, gets closed off and ostium secundum opens higher up. And then the septum secundum should start coming down here. And what you can see is that the holes in each one don't actually overlap. And that's important to allow that to close off later on. Otherwise, you end up with the patent for Omino Valley we talked about or mentioned earlier, which means that blood can get shoved back from the left side of your heart to the right side of the heart outside of the mother. And the reason that's problematic is because then you've got oxygenated blood on this side that's not getting to the body. So you're essentially just put, putting it back through to get oxygenated again, which is a waste of effort and reduces your uh, oxygen supply to the body. Yeah, and this is just another picture of that same idea. So again, not overlapping, thinner one on the left. And if you want a way to remember which side's first, just nobody thinks right and left, everyone thinks left and right. So the left one's first, then the right one. Okay, and this is a summary of 
all that um, takes between basically one and three months to close all that up. Okay. Uh, congenital defects, you don't need to know a ton about. Um, so to trial drift below, you've got to remember these four things that go together. Um, some of them will match up nicely. So for example, when you have uh, pulmonary stenosis, so that's when your pulmonary valve is too tight. You have more pressure you have to push against, which is why it makes sense for you to then have a hypertrophied right ventricle. And then the ventricular septal defect and overriding aorta, you just got to learn. Um, the coarctation, you just get narrowing of the aorta. And the only thing that you need to know for that is that you get blood pressure differences between the upper and lower limbs. Um, and you can get delays as well, which I should put here. But you can get delays as well between the pulses on each side. Uh, and lastly, the transposition is just normally uh, you have pulmonary arteries coming out of the right side and aorta out of the left. If you get it going the other way, then you can see how it's going to be a massive problem because you're going to have deoxygenated blood going to the body. So that's fixed uh, soon after birth. But that should be all you need for congenital. Oh, never mind. There's more. Um, persistent truncus. So that's when you don't separate your two main vessels. And again, similar problems. And then every hole in the heart can stay open. Um, and those have various di different issues. So this, the ventricular one's not that bad. Um, Penforomina valley, same thing. Because the thing is that most of the blood is still going the right way. It's just you got a bit going the wrong way. Um, there's not really much that can happen clinically with that, except for um, being able to get clots from the left side of the heart getting pushed to the right. So you know how normally clots on the left side of the heart get systemic problems like strokes or peripheral issues or kidney um, infarction. Instead of that, you can get a PE. <coughs> if you have that gap in the middle. Um, yeah, it should be cool. Okay, so starting from the most basic, atria in, ventricles out, left side's thicker because it has to go further, it has to go all around the body, right side's not as thick, just goes to the lungs for oxygenation. We've already talked about the bottom. Okay, this is good to know. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard the mnemonic already, but there's like fart police smell villains. So fibrous pericardium on the outermost, then uh, the parietal layer of the serous pericardium, then the pericardial space, which is where all your fluid lies. That's where if you have an effusion or something like that, that's where the um, fluid would gather between your parietal and visceral layers of the serous pericardium. And then the endocardium is just the innermost layer. Okay. Oh, and yeah, so uh, pericardial effusions will all gather in here. And the problem with that is that the total uh, volume in here is fixed. So if you're taking up more of it with fluid that's not in the heart, then you're reducing the amount that can be in the heart for you to pump out to the rest of your body. Okay, uh, so epicardium is the outermost and it's not that important. So visceral innovation, so you don't really notice very much from it. Myocardium's the one that does all the work for you. It's a thick muscle layer. Uh, the intercalated discs is a nice word to know. Um, and then the SA node is what controls it. Um, and the reason that that's important is that you can basically cut off nerve supply from everywhere else and the heart will continue to beat. And then the endocardium is the innermost and that's mainly where you'll get your infections like infective endocarditis. So we've already mentioned a bit about this. So the pericardium is just the sac that the heart sits in. And as I mentioned before, the phrenic nerve is what gives you the pain sensation from there. And it's C345, just like um, the diaphragm is. And so pain can be referred um, to similar locations, so it can be up to the shoulder. And it's nice that the parietal, the parietal layer is supplied by phrenic, so both P, and then visceral layer is supplied by vagus. Okay. As far as pericardial sinuses, um, the main one is the transverse one. I wouldn't worry too much about oblique, but this one's anterior to the SVC and posterior to the pulmonary trunk, just here and the aorta. <laughs> And the point of that is that if you need to do something like bypass grafting, you can separate blood going into the heart from blood going out. Any questions so far? All right, just like yell or something. Well, actually, nobody will yell. Stick your hand up or something. Okay, so um, the circu circulations, you can, if you know basically what's happening, you can BS your way through this. So for the systemic one, left atrium and left ventricle, and then out to everything and then back into the right atrium. And this blood should always be oxygenated until you've gone through the capillaries. And then pulmonary is going the other way. So it's a bit longer because you've got to go through the lungs. So you've got right atrium and ventricle, pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries, in the lungs where they get oxygenated across here. And then pulmonary veins, which are the only ones that carry oxygenated blood. 
back into the heart. Okay. So this is good to know as well, because this is the kind of thing you can see on an ECG, where there'll be ST elevation in various areas, and they'll ask you like, which, uh, which artery has been occluded to cause this kind of presentation. Um, so for the, your two main coronary arteries, which are just above the aortic valve, and instead of feeling like diastole uh, during systole, like everything else in your body does, where your heart contracts and it pumps around, they actually feel during diastole when everything relaxes and the blood can run down through them. So the right one supplies the right atrium and the left one supplies the left atrium and then they split into more branches. So uh, the ones that have asterisks can also be given off by the left coronary artery, but in general, it's gonna be the right one. So the important things from the right one would probably be the SA nodal branch, because that's the one that's gonna supply your main pacemaker in the heart. And so if you infarct that, you can change um, where the main uh, sorry, what's controlling your heart rate. So instead of it being the SA node, it can be the AV node, which will be a bit slower. Uh, marginal is one that goes along the bottom of the heart. AV nodal, that's what exactly what it says. And then the posterior interventricular is the one that goes down the back of the heart. There should be a picture later about this. And then on the left side, the anterior one is the one that gives you your uh, LED infarct or your widow maker or whatever you like to call it. And that, so that'll cause changes in your anterior leads, like I see V1 to 6. If you see a whole bunch through there, you get a pretty good chance that it's going to be this one. Uh, the lateral branch or diagonal is the one that goes along the outside of the heart and then circumflex kind of wraps around the back. So, just going over, actually, so one labels? Good. Okay, so right coronary wraps around here. So you can see that if you block the right coronary artery, you're going to get an infarct that's either more obvious on leads towards the right side of the body, because we're facing this person, right? So right side's over here. You can either get change in your right sided leads or in your inferior leads. So that's like your two, three AVF, because the areas that are going to be, um, that are going to die from it are all going to be on that side. The one wrapping around the back, we can see here, the circumflex where the uh, left coronary goes around, and the LED is the one that does a significant part of the heart's the interventricular septum and a bit of each ventricle, and that wraps all the way around to the back, which is why you get such widespread changes on an ECG if you manage to block it. Okay. Uh, the veins are much, much less important, and you're much more likely to get asked about an artery than a vein. Um, so everything, all the is everything ends up in this thing, the coronary sinus, which then drains into the right atrium. Um, and then the small one, Accompanying the marginal branch of the RCA. The middle one is the posterior, and then the great one follows the uh, anterior interventricular. So basically, the biggest one follows the biggest thing you can think of as an arterial structure. <coughs> cool. And this is just the pictures of it. So, yeah, great. Yeah. Coronary sinus, and you see it's coming back to the right atrium over here. Cool. Okay, so you have a valve following every chamber in the heart, not going into, but following. So you won't have one before the right atrium, but you'll have one coming out of it. So that one's your tricuspid. Then from the right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk is pulmonary. Then you don't have one between the pulmonary vasculature and the uh, left atrium, but you have one from the left atrium to ventricle, which is mitral. And then the last one is the aortic. So the chordae tendinae are what holds the uh, AV valves onto the ventricles, and then the papillary muscles basically hold onto them so that when your heart contracts, you don't just blast the valve back up into the atrium. Um, whereas the semilunar ones, which are the ones that lead out of your heart, so that's your aortic and pulmonary, um, they don't have cordae and you can just stick it out. As you can see, I was meant to find a picture of that and haven't got one yet. Thoracic plane, everyone's favorite T4. So literally just learn this um, and just pick whichever one is an option when they say which one is there, or alternatively run through all of these and cross them out until there's something that's not there, and that's probably gonna be it. Um, and usually they'll say something about thoracic plane or at the T4 level, and that's approximately where it is. Okay, mediastinum, um, having a general idea of where stuff is, is nice, but it's not something that comes up a lot, and nobody really wants to learn where everything is in the mediastinum. It's the kind of question that you kind of bin when you open the paper and you decide I'm not getting this one. <laughs> so T4 kind of splits it into superior and inferior, and inferior split into anterior, uh, middle, and posterior. Um, there are some things that would be obvious, like the esophagus is always at the back, and the only thing in the front is the thymus, but you shouldn't really need to know too much about that. 
it's all here anyway, just in case you want it though. So yeah, I won't go through all that and look at it later. Uh, peripherally, there's only a few things you need to know. Arteries are thicker because they have that ability to contract and that muscular tone. Uh, veins have valves to prevent blood from falling back through them because you only want one way flow, obviously. And then arteries are away and veins are towards the heart. Okay, uh, three layers. Um, again, you only need to know them broadly. So the intima one is inside, in, so it's the innermost one. And it's just one layer of endothelial cells. Um, and that's mainly just kind of controlling tone in there. The tunica media is the one that actually has all of your muscle. So it's the one that does uh, when you're trying to react with your sympathetic nervous system. It's the one that tightens or relaxes. And then the external or adventitial layer is just there to kind of hold it in place inside everything else. Okay, so as far as the types of vessels go, it's basically a spectrum. So you go from one end where it's very muscular, very thick, all the way to very thin and essentially incapable of contracting. They're just vessels. So the largest ones are the pressure reservoirs. And the point of them is that your heart, well, your heart beats and then stops and then beats and then stops. And you want flow to be continuous through that. You don't want all the blood in your body to sit still for a second while your heart gets going for the next one. Uh, then the medium ones are the ones that control the blood flow itself. Um, and they're the ones that do most of the contraction. So the large ones tend to just kind of carry stuff and hold the pressure, but they don't contract as much. And then the arterioles are where you lose most of the um, blood pressure. Now, I know this seems super irrelevant, but I think we have had a question at some point about where, where do you lose all of the blood pressure or, um, and it's the arterioles. And the capillaries are all the tiny ones which have a single layer and that's where all your diffusion into tissues actually takes place. And then the veins, much like in the heart, are much more simple. They, none of them really do anything, but the medium ones are the ones that have valves. Uh, and also they have the greatest proportion of all the blood in the body. Capillaries. So again, it's only three here. So, and the names kind of give you a hint as to what's going on. So the continuous ones are the ones that are the tightest or the ones that let the least through. So um, things like the blood brain barrier where you don't want much getting through except what you absolutely need um, will have continuous uh, endothelium. Fenestrated ones will allow some stuff to come through. So like you guys have done renal by now. So things like the glomerular vessels where you want some stuff to get through, um, but you don't want like protein and blood coming out. Sorry, um, and red blood cells coming out is where you have fenestrated, uh, fenestrated endothelium. And then sinusoidal are the ones that have huge gaps. And that's where you need blood cells to be coming out in places like your lymph nodes. Okay, endothelium, uh, don't really need to know much of this. Um, knowing about nitric oxide as something that relaxes it and angiotensin II as something that contracts it is good um, in terms of their effect on resistance and blood pressure. This stuff's kind of bonus. Uh -huh. Cool. All right. Any questions about any of that? All right. So broadly, this is what we're going to go through in physiology, excitation, kinetic output, cycle and heart sounds, um, which is important for the inevitable one question that you'll get about a murmur, um, flow and resistance, and control of your blood pressure. So. Uh, we talked about, well, we mentioned intercalated discs. So the gap junctions are what allow them to basically contract all in one go. So instead of part of your heart contracting and slowly working its way around, it contracts in a coordinated way so it has proper output. And there's a set pathway that it basically always, find, uh, always follows. So everything starts in the SA node, then goes through internodal pathways to your AV node. And this is where things slow down for a second. And that's because you've got some fibrous tissue here and fewer gap junctions for to move through. Then you've got your two bundles of Hiss and then finally your Purkinje fibers going to the uh, ventricles. And the point of having that slow down in the AV node is so that you have time for diastole where you're basically relaxing your heart and letting your ventricles fill up so that you have something to pump out during systole. Okay, so you don't need to know any of these numbers, just broadly more sodium and calcium outside and more potassium inside. Potassium out is repolarization, and uh, cal sodium and calcium out, so in, is depolarization. So it's pretty similar to around the rest of the body there. So that's a lot of channels that you don't need to know a lot about, um, but this broad structure is important. So the key here is that it fires on its own. So you notice that rather than in the rest of the body where you have like a nice flat um, kind of constant uh, AP before, sorry, 
uh, voltage before you fire. Here, it's always moving up, up, up on its own, so that then when it reaches this threshold here, it can fire off a pacemaker action potential. So basically, it has no stable plateau or resting potential. And that's important so that it can fire without you needing to supply it from everywhere else in your body beforehand. Okay. And the ventricular is different. So this one does have a stable resting potential out here and before here. <coughs> and then it goes through all these. You don't need to know about all these channels. It's just, again, here for you to have a look at if you'd like to. Um, the important thing here is that there's a long refractory period after you fire. So that means that you can't have um, what's called summated contractions, which you might have briefly mentioned in first year, which is basically just if you fire a whole bunch of signals really quickly, you get bigger and bigger contractions. Okay. So pacing, uh, you just need to know these three. So the fastest one is the one that sets the speed and everything else follows it. Um, so SA node is between 60 and 100, AV between 40 and 60, and Pekinji between 15 and 40 beats a minute. And then arrhythmias can form in a variety of different ways. So either you can have an ectopic focus, which is just somewhere else in the heart firing when it shouldn't, and that can give you things like AF or BF. You can have the pacemaker shift from the SA node elsewhere. So for example, if you manage to damage the right part of your uh, right coronary artery, so the SA nodal branch, and you've managed to kill off your SA node, then your AV node will take over. Uh, you can have abnormal formation in the SA node itself, and that can happen from, uh, again, ischemia there as well, or scarring or anything else. And lastly, if you have anything that's going to actually stop conduction through the heart. So things like heart block, or if you've had a heart attack in the past and you managed to get some scarring and some ischemia along the pathway, then things aren't going to conduct through there like they used to. So you've probably seen this picture before. Um, so in this one, if you lose the SA node, then the next fastest thing takes over. So it's the AV node. So you go at 50, or rather miles would be beats per minute. Here, if you lose the AV node, because the SA node is still the fastest, that's still the one that's going to set your base speed. And then ectopic focus, so that's where somewhere else is just going absolutely nuts and firing really quickly. And that's going to basically override your SA node because it's going faster. Okay. All right, so next cardiac output. Um, it seems really basic, but if you know that this is what cardiac output comes from, then you can work out what you need to do to basically increase or decrease it. So stroke volume by heart rate, and on average, it's about 70 by 70. Um, so this is like, you don't really have any control over this. It's all autonomic. Um, so you balance sympathetic and parasympathetic input there. So for stroke volume, either you can change how much blood you fill the heart with or your end diastolic volume, um, or you can alter calcium levels. So during exercise, uh, it should go up a lot. And if it's not going up properly, so for example, if you have some valve disease that's preventing you from pumping out properly, or if you have a slow heart rate, um, then even if you try to increase stroke volume, if this is staying really low, you're still going to end up with rubbish output. Um, and this is something that seems to come up reasonably often as well, is just that you go from skeletal muscle having only a small proportion of your uh, cardiac output to quite a large amount during exercise. So for control, like we said, parasympathetic or sympathetic. Parasympathetic is slow, um, and it slows pacemaking in the SA node itself, and also conduction through the AV node, um, and also it reduces how strongly your ventricles actually contract. Whereas the sympathetic nervous system basically does the opposite. It makes things go faster, it conducts faster, and it increases how hard they contract, and that's using adrenaline to bind to beta-1 adrenoceptors. Uh, so we've talked about this already, and we can tell that the heart's largely uh, parasympathetically controlled or has a vagal tone as opposed to sympathetic because most people's resting heart rate if healthy is not 100. But if you cut off all the innovation to the heart, um, it goes faster, which implies that beforehand parasympathetic was having a stronger input. Okay. Um, so this is like a lot of physiology, but the broad, the broad mechanism is basically if you put more blood in, you stretch the muscle fibers, and so then they can contract harder and you get more blood out. And then if you do that on one side of the heart, so usually it's if you do right ventricle first, if you fill that side more, you put more blood in, more blood comes out, then as a result, you get more blood on the left side as well. So it fills more and it can push more out. And so that's how your body balances the amount of cardiac output you get from both sides. And if that fails, that's where you get things like heart failure, where you're getting blood either backed up into your systemic circulation, so you get like peripheral edema, all that kind of stuff, or alternatively backed up into the 
lungs if you have left heart failure because you're not taking all the fluid out from there. Okay, venous return. There's a lot here. You don't really need to know a lot of it, but it's here if you're interested. Um, this, this is the important bit. The venous return needs to be the same as your cardiac output. And as we just mentioned, if they're not the same, then you're going to end up with heart failure and edema. Okay. Uh, outside of the heart itself, uh, skeletal muscle, so things like in your legs, uh, they can provide some of the uh, some contraction to help push blood up from your legs because they're quite low down. But that relies on the fact that you have intact valves in your legs as well because your skeletal muscle is not going to do a lot to push. So if you've got blood falling back every time it pushes, then it's not going to go anywhere. Um, and then uh, you guys have done rest. Yeah, so when you breathe in, pressure drops inside your thorax um, and rises further down in the abdomen. And so that basically reduces how much pressure um, the heart's going towards and increases the pressure it's coming from. So you get um, more blood coming back into the heart. And then the opposite occurs during expiration. And this is just a whole bunch of pictures that demonstrate some of that. So, so this is the other way of altering stroke volume, so with calcium. And this is how you can do uh, things with calcium channel blockers we'll talk about later. But basically just calcium entry is a massive determinant of your contraction. Um, and that needs both in, intra, sorry, intra and extracellular calcium stores. Things like adrenaline and the SNS, like this is the mechanism they use to help increase your heart rate and stroke volume. You know, increase how much calcium is going in. Uh, and so that will increase this. Da, da, da. Yeah, you don't really need to have that much. Just calcium in more. And if you have less calcium around, your heart will contract less and it'll be slower. Right. Uh, so cardiac cycle, if you understand this, you'll understand a lot of um, different questions about heart sounds, things like that. So just very basically, diastole is this chunk here. So uh, which pressures do we want? Uh, volumes, yeah. So during diastole, most of your filling is on its own. So your atria don't actually do very much, but they do have some contributions. That's that last 20%. But most of it is passive, which is why people with AF don't just drop dead, because most of the filling is going to occur without the atria actually doing anything for them. After that, the ventricles begin to contract um, and you increase pressure. And then once that exceeds the pressure outside the heart, it overrides it and so heart, the heart will push blood out and then it relaxes and we go back to the start. So systole is the part where you push out, so phases one and four, and then diastole is the part where you're filling the heart. Okay. So the heart sounds. The first one's at the end of diastole, um, so that's when you're filling up. So if it's when you're filling up, then the end of diastole must be when the ventricles are full. So you're going to close off what's between the ventricles and the atria. Mm -hmm. And then the second one's at the end of systole, so when your heart's pushing out. So it makes sense if it's at the end of when your heart's pushing out, it's just <coughs> closing off the thing that your heart's just pushed out into. So your aortic valve has just been open to allow blood through. And when it closes, that's the second heart sound. And the pulmonary is just doing the same thing but it'll be in the uh, pulmonary artery instead. And so this is what's happening on the ECG with each of these. So when there's no uh, electrical activity, that's the passive filling during its start. Uh, the P wave is the actual uh, atrial contraction. And you can see it's much smaller than the ventricular one because it's much less going on here. And you've got your QRS complex here where your uh, ventricle is going to be contracting and the T wave here, and then you come back to relaxation and you start filling the heart back up again at one. Okay, and this is just a whole summary of that, which you can look at later. Okay, um, this, this thing makes it look more complicated, but it's not that complicated, just the change in pressure you have across a vessel divided by how much resistance there is, is basically how much flow you get. So if you have a greater pressure difference between the start and the end of the tube, it's going to go faster. And if you have more stuff stopping things going through the tube, the resistance, then it's going to go slower. Um, that's really all you need here. Um, obviously, it always goes down. And uh, viscosity, so how thick your blood is, um, <coughs> hematocrit, so uh, how many red blood cells you have sitting in your blood uh, is what decides viscosity. But it's usually not really relevant unless you have um, a specific, like, uh, myeloproliferative disease. So as far as resistance goes, it's these three. 
length, viscosity, and radius. And the big one is radius. The viscosity we've just talked about, you can't really do very much about. The length, you can't shorten or extend your arteries as you feel like it. And so the main thing is going to be radius. And it's, radius is really blurry, but to the power of four. And so that's the biggest thing, which is good because that's the only one we can control as well. Um, so you can have a question on this about if we doubled the radius um, like proportionally, what will happen to the flow? So if you double it, it's going to be 2, 4, 8, 16 times more. And pressure is based on these two things, the volume, so just how much stuff you have in the vessel, and compliance, so your ability of the vessel to handle that extra volume. So the two volumes that you have are VO, which is just literally how much you need to fill it um, without pushing on the walls, and then VS is how much you have after you've already filled just the raw volume inside. Um, and so the pressure, oh sorry, the compliance is the total stress volume, so how much extra volume you can fit per unit of change in pressure, right? So if you can add more volume, like you can in veins, for every one you increase in pressure, then it's a more compliant vessel. And then elasticity is just the opposite of that, so it's the ability to contract against it. Yeah, and this is just a picture of exactly that. So you can see that if you add the same volume, so let's go here, the pressure, uh, wait, what the hell's going on here? And more volume, pressure. Oh yeah, so if you put like this much pressure in, uh, volume in, the pressure in this one's only down here. But if you imagine this kept going forever and ever and ever and ever, <coughs> you'd have to be going like miles and miles down this way to put this much um, volume into an artery. So your pressure would be enormous. Okay, uh, blood vessels. So the only ones that can really actually do anything per se is the arterioles, um, which can actually contract. Veins can become uh, more compliant, but they don't really do too much for you. But the point of them is that if the arteries um, contract, they're going to increase resistance, which will decrease the flow through them because you're going to go through a tighter tube. And we've talked about the fact that radius is the most important determinant here. Whereas for veins, um, if you stiffen them, rather than decreasing flow, they'll actually increase flow. And so you get more venous pressure, you get more filling of the heart, and so outflow actually increases with that. Okay. This is a whole mess um, of all kinds of different things that can control your blood pressure. You don't need to know all of these, and this is way too much, but there's a few things that are good to know. So in the short term, uh, you've got the baroreceptors. So these are all things that start pretty much straight away. So if you've ever stood up and had that moment where you feel like you're about to pass out, um, <coughs> that's your baroreceptors. That's when your baroreceptors are going to go, that's not good. So you got your carotid sinuses and aortic <coughs> arch, which contribute to that. Um, so uh, when you have increased blood pressure, so you have increased stretch of them, they fire faster. And then that tells the medulla to basically uh, activate your autonomics to change all the things we just talked about. So the heart in terms of how quickly it's going, the veins in terms of how um, stiff or not stiff they are, and the arterioles in terms of contracting or being relaxed to try and bring your blood pressure back, uh, blood pressure back to normal. Um, and so that's mainly sympathetic, and that's uh, how you recover from things like going from lying down to standing up, uh, which is also the point of testing things like orthostatic hypotension in people. So if their autonomics aren't working, specifically their sympathetic nervous system, then they'll stand up and their blood pressure won't get back to normal, basically. Okay, so medium, the RAS, uh, should have done this in renal a lot. Um, broad pathway, just angiotensinogen, so the, should go the, uh, we'll come, well, there's a picture of it later, but start with angiotensinogen, then renin turns it into angiotensin, and then ACE, which we'll also talk about later, turns it into angiotensin 2, and then you get uh, aldosterone at the very end of that pathway. So if you have less blood pressure, then you release more angiotensin, which if you think about the name, the angio is the blood vessel, and then the tensin, so it's going to make them contract. Um, so that's one way that it increases your blood pressure. And then the other way is that it leads to creation of aldosterone, which will increase sodium fluid reabsorption, which then brings the amount of fluid you have back to normal. So you have a uh, better filling of all your vessels, and so the pressure goes back up. Yeah, and then the long term, so the one that never fades, renal control of uh, sodium and blood pressure. Uh, if we have a look here, so if um, blood pressure increases uh, and slightly, the change in um, 
salt intake and output is dramatic. So you can see from like here, if we say that's like 95 to 100, it goes like, whoop. yeah. So if your blood pressure rises at all, your body basically just throws sodium and water out with it until your blood pressure comes back down. So infinite feedback gain just means that um, it's almost perfect. So if you, assuming your kidneys work properly, if you wait long enough, they'll always bring your blood pressure back to where it's supposed to be. Uh, the only problems that you can get with it is if you end up with a different renal set point, so where your kidneys think your blood pressure should be, then they won't bring it back down because your body thinks that having a blood pressure of 140 systolic is normal. And so it's not going to do anything when you're sitting there. Okay. okay. Um, so as response to hemorrhage. So if you lose a lot of blood, uh, you have less, this is mean systemic pressure, so just less pressure overall. Um, and so then you have uh, less means return, less end diastolic volume, less cardiac output. So you have the SNS to basically constrict first. So that's because your body's going, crap, there's nothing in the vessels. So I'll just make them tighter so that there's less space that any blood needs to fill anyway. But then after a while that fails, the PSNS takes over and then you pass out because you dilate everything. So everything important goes down, blood pressure, heart rate, resistance, venous return and cardiac output. And all those things drop, you're going to drop as well. Okay, things to know. Um, talked about this one, this one less important, this really important, uh, proportional to change in pressure, inversely proportional to radius, same for resistance, especially this one, radius to the power of four, and this one, not so much, but this, big deal. Okay, farm. So this is basically what you need. Uh, so fat stuff, blood pressure stuff, lub dub stuff, uh, uh, fluid stuff, and pain stuff. So lipid lowering, um, statins, big one. And it is worth actually knowing the mechanism of action just because it's really easy to just have a question that's which of these works by inhibiting HMG-CoA reductase. And if you haven't seen HMG-CoA reductase, you're not going to be able to guess that from seeing the letters statin at the end of something. So just associate the words and that should be enough. Um, less important to really go through all acetyl-CoA, making cholesterol, yada, yada, yada. Um, but if you do know how each one works, it tells you what they're used for as well. So because statins mainly work on a cholesterol pathway, it's better for hypercholesterolemia as opposed to fibrates, which are for lipoprotein breakdown, which carry your um, lipids around the body. It's better for triglyceridemia. And then azetamibes, like, it's a cool one, but it's not used very much. Um, and so it reduces absorption of cholesterol. And so if you have less reabsorbs on the way through your body, then you pass more out. And so your cholesterol goes down with it. Okay. Next, antihypertensives, just A, B, C, D. Um, and that's essentially the really big ones. Uh, ACE inhibitors slash ARBs are some of the most important ones, and they're very often used. Um, and these all try to work on one of these two things. So either you have too much fluid in your vessels, and so the pressure, the pressure in them goes up, so diuretics are the main ones for that, although ACE inhibitors can contribute to that to an extent as well. And then it can also be that your vessels are too tight or you have too much resistance in them. And beta blockers and calcium channel blockers do a lot for this as well. And ACE inhibitors a bit too. Um, and this is just a good thing to know, I think, is that uh, if you have long-standing hypertension, so where you haven't been treated or you've been sitting with high blood pressure that you don't know about for quite a long time, then your left ventricle is going to become hypertrophied because it's what's pushing against the most pressure in your body. And so if it's finding that it's more difficult, then your body's going to react to that by putting more and more muscle into it, which comes with its own problems. But just to know that it's the left ventricle that's going to grow with long-standing hypertension first. Okay, so going through some of the individual ones, so ACE inhibitors fortunately come with what they do in their name. They inhibit angiotensin converting enzyme. Uh, they reduce constriction. And then we talked about this already. And then this is how it does uh, a bit to do with the fluid. So it reduces aldosterone, which would normally help you to reabsorb fluid. So you can lose a bit more as well. Prill is the layers you're looking for. And then the adverse effects, the main ones to know about are the cough and hyperkalemia. Um, so you can get that as a multi, or it could be something about someone who's been on an antihypertensive and has developed a bit of a cough. Um, what should you put them on? And it's not ACE inhibitors because this, uh, contraindications, angioedema is um, one that comes up a lot, and yeah, again, you guys done renal, so triple whammy, you can't put these three together. 
NSAIDs, diuretics, and ACE inhibitors. Okay. ARBs are very similar. Um, so it's the same kind of pathway, but instead of doing something to the amount of angiotensin you actually have, they just stop it from working by blocking what it wants to bind to. So these are all the SARTANs, and you use that for people who can't tolerate ACE inhibitors for things like the cough. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, ACE normally helps to um, break down bradykinin. So if you stop ACE from working itself, then you lead, that leads to excess um, bronchoconstrictor bradykinin, and so you get tighter airways in the cough. Whereas for ARBs, because you're not actually doing anything to um, ACE itself, you're doing things to what this wants to bind to, uh, this function of ACE isn't actually inhibited, so you don't get that cough with it. But you still get hyperkalemia because the end result is the same. Okay, oh, here's the picture. Yeah, so angiotensinogen, renin from the kidneys turns into angiotensin 1. Then ACE, which you get from the lungs for some reason, turns into 2, and it does all these different things. And the main ones that you want to know about right now are arteriolar vasoconstriction and maybe a bit about the aldosterone coming out. Uh, this stuff, actually, you might have done or you will do in endocrine. Um, yeah. Still all good? Okay. So next, beta blockers, your olols. Um, so the main ones, that, uh, main receptors that you use in the heart to make it go faster are the beta 1 adrenoceptors. Um, and so if you block them, then it does what it says on the tin and it slows things down. So yeah, slower heart rate. And because we've talked about how heart rate and stroke volume are the two contributors to um, cardiac output, if you reduce heart rate, you're going to reduce cardiac output. Um, and then this is also just another side effect it has, which is that it reduces renin release, which would normally then help you make angiotensin 2. So that drops your vascular resistance as well. But the main thing is the heart effects up here, the beta-1 adrenoceptors. Uh, the first line, though, is not this. It's ACE inhibitors. And the adverse effects, everyone's heard about the asthma thing. So here you can't give it to people who have asthma. Um, and then also, because it slows your heart down, you can get a slow heart from it. Okay. Calcium channel blockers. Um, you don't need to know these names per se, but know that there are two different types. So your nifedipine and amlodipine are the ones that cause reflex tachycardia because you're reducing peripheral resistance. So your body has to go a bit faster because now you're just getting more, um, it's easier to pump against basically. And in order to maintain the pressure, it needs to put more fluid out, out, out. Whereas the uh, non-dihydropyridines are the ones like verapamil or diltiazem, and these are the ones that won't cause a reflex tachy. So ideally you want to use these because a reflex tachy is kind of negating some of the benefits that you were getting from using the calcium channel blocker in the first place. Uh, and you can't use them with beta blockers because both of them reduce how hard the heart's working. So if you use two things that are going to reduce it, then you have a pretty good chance of giving them heart failure instead of helping them. And the main adverse effects to know about um, edema. So that's one reason that people don't end up on these is because they can't tolerate the fact they have swollen legs all the time. And then again, because you're going to be slowing down the heart, let's talk about here, because you need calcium for heart conduction, slow it down, you can get bradycardia from that as well. And this is like a side effect of everything. Okay, um, this is just what we were talking about. So as you can see, the dipenes are the only ones that give you the reflex tachy um, in your heart rate. So ideally, you want to use these two instead. Okay, diuretics, you should have already done. So I'm not going to go too hard into it. But frizomide, if you want to get rid of a lot of volume, so if someone's got like um, acute pulmonary edema, because they have decompensated heart failure or something, you want to give them that first, and then you can move them down to something less intense like hydrochlorothiazide or spironolactone later. Um, and know what the electrolyte effects of these are. So these two both um, cause hypokalemia, because this one's going to reduce potassium reabsorption, and this one further down the tubule, which you probably have done in renal, also re reduces potassium reabsorption. So both of these lead to increased potassium loss and hypokalemia, <coughs> and the potassium sparing does what it says, so it can give you hyperkalemia. Okay, and then some pictures of mechanism action, which you can look at later. Okay, antiarrhythmics. So you don't do much about slow hearts unless they're um, like unless they've got symptoms, basically. So if they're tolerating it just fine, you don't need to do anything. But if someone's passing out when they stand up or not able to get around the house, um, which are mainly passed out, you can give them emergency atropine, um, which 
as an anticholinergic binding to the muscarinic receptors in the heart, basically reduces parasympathetic activity. So if you have less parasympathetic activity, then you have less activity slowing the heart. The heart can go a bit faster. So everything important happens with the fast ones instead. So your AF, the other <coughs> AF, but atrial flutter instead, uh, VF, VT, and then torsades. Torsades you won't need to know too much about, but just know what it looks like, I think. So who wants to tell me what this one is? There's like five of these, so yeah, it's gonna take a while if we. <laughs> AF? Yeah. Yeah, like, if you feel free to point to a P wave if you can see one, but there isn't one. And anything that's irregularly irregular, so you can see like this long gap here, then a short one, then a bit longer, then a short one. Anything that's irregularly irregular is pretty much guaranteed to be AF. This one. Let's go on here. Wait a second. No, this isn't AF. Who said AF? <laughs> That one was flooded, that one's AF. This one's crazier. So, see this small gap here? Long, long, shorter, shorter, long, short, long. Okay. <laughs> That's right, it looks, it looks crazy, but basically if you just look for things that look nuts, you only have a few options. So, Things that look nuts include this, this, and this. <laughs> so, does anyone want to have a guess at what this is? Or what this is? All right, well, during the slides, you can look at them later. I'll tell you, this one's VT. So, you tell that because it's nice and regular, and these are nice and wide. And ventricular tachycardia is where it's coming from, your, um, where your ventricles are the ones contracting on their own are the ones where you get wide QRS complexes. So you can see that each heartbeat looks really wide and basically just like lumps into the next one. And then this last one, if you see an absolute mess and you have no idea what's happening, it's VF. That's, things are going absolutely nuts. And at the very, uh, if it starts kind of like wheeling around like this, then it's torsades where it's kind of going like bigger and then smaller. Um, so it starts small, gets big, and then gets really small. So like this kind of progression here. Okay, cool. Okay, right, so there's a lot of different anti arrhythmics. Um, you sh well, actually, you might need to know one, two, three, four. Um, so the mechanism, I think you're less likely to be asked about in terms of like these narrow bits down here. So just know broadly what they do. The class one sodium, um, and know like one or two uh, examples of it. Uh, class two is beta blockers. So we've already talked about those and use those for AF. And that's important because it reduces um, how the automaticity, which is like how ready your SA node is to fire on its own, because that can be the problem in AF is it's just too ready to go. And so it just fires whenever it feels like it. Class three, um, there's only two that you actually need to know, Sotolol and Amiodarone. Um, amiodarone is disgusting. So if you can think of a side effect, you have a pretty good chance that you're gonna get it from Amiodarone. I can use this for all kinds of nasty um, areas like AF, VF or VT. And then class four is calcium channel blockers. And we've talked about how those work. And because you uh, don't have calcium entry for conduction, you're going to help reduce how ready your heart is to just go nuts. Okay. And this is just kind of where they affect on um, the ventricular potential, but I don't think you need to know this per se. Okay. Other stuff. Um, digoxin, also pretty gross. Um, you can use that for AF2 though. Um, and you need to use it carefully because it's very easy to give someone digoxin poisoning. So it's got a very narrow therapeutic range. Um, and adenosine is used for supraventricular SVT um, tachycardia. Um, and the combination is you can use Valsalva, you can use adenosine, and use it for rapamil. Okay. Heart failure. So if you think about what the problems are in heart failure, then you can work out what drugs you actually need to treat it. So if you think about the fact that people get edema, it's because they've got too much fluid in them. So if you give them something to get rid of um, all that fluid, then they'll feel better, so diuretics. Then if the heart's not contracting properly and you're losing cardiac output, a positive inotrope, something which helps your heart contract, like digoxin can help. And then because sometimes the heart's going too quickly and you don't have time for your heart to fill, so you have shortened diastole, um, and that contributes to the reduced uh, cardiac output, 
then you can use a beta blocker to slow down the heart and increase the time it has to fill. And it's important to know that uh, you can't use calcium channel blockers for heart failure. So that's always wrong if it's the option. Okay. Uh, Anti-anginals. So angina is basically just your heart wants more. It wants more oxygen than you can give it. Um, so the two ways that you can fix that is either you give it more or you make it ask for less. So calcium channels, uh, calcium channel blockers help you give it more. So it opens up your coronary vessels <coughs> and go through more oxygen to the heart. Beta blockers can help in a similar way. So uh, if you slow down the heart, remember we said that the heart's uh, coronary arteries fill during diastole. So if you slow the heart down, those vessels have more time to fill. And so then more oxygenated blood can get through to your heart. And then GTM um, increases nitric oxide, which I mentioned before as one of the few that is good to know. Um, nitric oxide helps you to dilate your blood vessels. So if you increase that, then again, you make it easier to give your heart more blood. And so it can work better and you'll get rid of this pain. And then if you want to reduce demand, beta blockers help do that as well because it reduces the heart rate, which talked about here. And calcium channel blockers do the same thing. Okay. Um, things to know about GTM, you can give it on the skin or um, sublingual, so you can get something like under the tongue. Um, and the reason for that is that if you just eat it, then basically your liver will get rid of most of it and you won't actually get any benefit out of it. Pretty much just used for this. Um, adverse effects, they're all related to you dropping blood pressure. So uh, if you drop blood pressure, hypotensive, you can get dizzy because of that. Your heart will go faster because you've dropped your blood pressure. And because it's going faster, suddenly you can get palpitations from it. And you can't use it with um, Viagra or beta blockers because both of these will um, reduce your blood pressure together and then you pass out. All right, um, so this is kind of, I think, where most of the question style uh, will come from um, on Viagra because they're less likely to get a venous return curve than someone who has ischemic heart disease or something. Um, so you have ac acute coronary syndromes and non-acute coronary syndromes. So this is stuff you're more worried about and this is stuff where you're a bit more relaxed. So you can't actually tell these apart clinically. You need some investigations for that. Um, but stable angina, you can tell based on the characteristics of it on history. So things like the fact uh, that it doesn't last that long um, or that it's relieved with rest or with nitrates. Um, tells you that it's more, much more likely to be a stable angina than it is to be something where they, it's going to be an emergency. Yeah, so AMIs, um, how long they last is a bit variable between different people, but usually it lasts longer than any angina they've had before. Um, usually it comes on quite quickly, and the main thing is chest pain, uh, crushing, central, radiating to things on the left, like the arm and also neck and jaw, and then associated symptoms, uh, sweating, sense of impending doom, and uh, nausea and vomiting as well. Uh, pericarditis, so that's inflammation of the pericardium, which we uh, looked at earlier, uh, usually doesn't last that long, and, and it usually comes on quite quickly. The chest pain is different in this case. So rather than it being a crushing, dull pain, it's pleuritic. So it's worse when they breathe, and it'll be written as something like sharp or piercing pain. Um, and it can be better when they sit up and lean forward, because you've got inflammation of the sac around the heart, so if you're lying back, then it's kind of got every, it's sitting on everything and it's got more stuff to rub against. Whereas if you sit up and lean forward, it kind of can um, hang there without touching as much other stuff inside you. Um, and then some other symptoms you can get, if it's an infection, you get a fever, maybe cough and shortness of breath. But the main thing will be chest pain, worse on inspiration. Okay. Heart failure. So this usually takes quite a long time to come on. Um, and there's usually other stuff that leads to it. So something like having had ischemic heart disease or a heart attack before, hypertension and renal problems. Um, there's two types of, of onset. So this is the kind that people in the community get where just over time, they can't do what they used to do. They get short of breath quicker. Um, and then rapid onset is where something happens like they have a heart attack or something and it kills off a lot of their heart. So then nothing's contracting properly and you end up with a heart that's not gonna pump. And if it's not gonna pump, then the left side's not gonna push out to the body, fluid goes back through the circulation, and so it ends up in the lungs and you get APO. Uh, so we talked about this now. Um, peripherally or in the lungs depends on which side of the heart's affected first. So, good? It's, um, is it, do you have a question? Okay. Um, so peripherally tends to be right side of the heart because 
the peripheries lead to the right side. So if that side's not working well, all the fluid goes back. And if it's in the lungs, then it's probably going to be the left side. Yeah, associated symptoms, you can get weight gain. Um, and that's because you're going to be carrying around a ton of fluid. You can get fatigue and weakness. <coughs> cough can be from the fluid in the lungs. Reduced appetite. Cough again. And ascites. Okay. AS, this is the main valve thing that you actually need to know. Um, AS makes you sad. If you take just one thing for the day, AS makes you sad. So syncope, angina, dyspnea, exertion. Um, and associated things, sorry, this, uh, yeah, mid systolic ejection murmur. Um, if you know where all your valves are, usually you can turn every valve question into a 50 50. Like, because they're always, because you're in second year, they always tell you, you know, it's on the left second intercostal space. Um, ladder on inspiration, so you know it's going to be pulmonary, and you've only got regurg or stenosis. Um, and then if you know what's happening in the heart during that, then you can work out um, whether it's one or the other. And there's a question about that in a sec. Okay. Oh, didn't draw a picture of you for this either. That's good. So, um, at last, like uh, AS, basically, this takes as long as it takes for um, a repair to become necessary to become a problem. So. A lot of people can have mitral regurge without having any symptoms. It can just be like a little bit of fluid going back. Um, and so it's usually a slow thing that kind of comes on with time. Main symptoms are those of heart failure because you're going to have blood getting shoved back through, um, back into the atrium during ventricular contraction. So it's not going to go out into the periphery. And so you get left sided heart failure. And then things like dyspnea, orthopnea, peripheral edema, fatigue. The main thing on exam is pan-systolic murmur, loudest where the mitral valve is, and going into the axilla. Yeah, aortic dissection. So, um, yeah, you die pretty fast if it happens, so you're not gonna have to worry too, too much about it if they've been there for a while. Um, onset is basically instant, um, separation of the layers of the aorta, because, because it's such a high pressure and high capacitance vessel, if you tear through that, like the tear is gonna go so quickly. Um, so general, generally, uh, much like pneumothorax, tall, skinny people who have Marfan syndrome tend to get it. Um, so basketball players and the like. The main thing is chest pain, it's tearing, goes to the back. Um, so you can get asymmetrical pulses if you do it in the arch, because now, if you remember the branches of the arch of the aorta, um, the left and right side come off separately. So if you tear past one of them but not the other, then you're going to have asymmetrical pulses. Uh, you can get syncope and dyspnea if tamponade occurs, so where you fill the space around the heart with fluid, and so it has no room to contract, and so you get less output, shortness of breath, and passing out, and like we said, something like a connective tissue disease. Questions? All right, so if I turn up at ED, I'm tall, I'm skinny, I can only have two things, what do I have? Yeah, and so let's say I have some chest pain, what do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Anyone? Save in confidence. Believe. It can only be two things. <laughs> <laughs> no, so either I have a dissection, because I'm tall and skinny, I probably have my fans, or it's a pneumothorax. Just tall, skinny people. That's all you need. Okay, real questions. So, 65 year old man, progressive dyspnea over the course of a month, has chest pain on climbing the stairs each night to go to bed. And he briefly passed out last week. So, and this is like the amount of information you end up with like on actual quests. You get all of this. And then at the very end, they ask you, so which of these is it? So, anyone? AS. Yeah, really easy, right? And like, in general, you're only going to get AS or MR. It's pretty much always going to be one of those two, just because those are the important ones. They're the most common. Um, so the key things about that, we've talked about the sad thing. Um, general rules, so stuff that's, the way I remember it is that stuff that's in the middle, so you have got like one, two, three, four valves. Stuff that's in the middle or on the inside is louder on inspiration. Stuff that's on the outside is louder on expiration. Um, so that helps you narrow it down as well. And then if we think about what's happening, it can tell you about regurg versus stenosis. So if it's during systole, when your heart's trying to push out to the body, the only way that you can make a noise during that is either you're pumping back through something which shouldn't be open, so then it must be regurgitant to the atria, or you're pumping through something to the body which is resisting, and that's where you get stenosis of aortic or pulmonary valves. And then diastolic, you're much less likely to get, but if it's during diastole, your heart's relaxing, so either something's coming back through something it shouldn't, so it has to be aortic or pulmonary, or 
it's not going through the uh, the atrioventricular valves properly, the filling that's happening during diastole. So if you keep all that in mind, you should be able to answer basically every valve question because all of them follow this kind of rule. And then this is just the two associations, things that go for the whole of systole or pansystolic, it's mitral regurge, when it's ejection, so I just remember that as like the heart's contracting to eject um, through the aortic valve, it's aortic stenosis. Okay, and this is just a picture to kind of correlate those. So S1, S2, so here's systole. If you have a problem with something you're contracting through, it has to occur through here. And if you're going back through something while you contract, it also has to be through here. So that's how you remember what's going on in the heart during those. Okay. Next. Oh, okay, so lady with heart failure due to ejection fraction, it's two days of PND, orthopnea, and this. Anyone tell me what that is? Man, this must be our lecturer's feel. Did someone say it loudly? <laughs> yeah, and so what's happened in the heart failure? She's turned up with a couple of days of it, or maybe even one day of it. She's suddenly feeling really short of breath. Anyone? Effusion. Yeah, uh, close. Similar to effusion, but a different word. Edema. Yeah, so um, this is acute pulmonary edema. So you got fluid all the way through the lungs. It's on both sides. Um, you guys might remember this. I mean, it's pretty crap on this, but like the bat, the bat wing thing, cardiomegaly, you can't really see the borders of the heart properly. Um, and also the history just really sounds like it's heart failure. Actually, they tell you that. And people with PND and orthopnea, like why do you get PND or orthopnea? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So which of these should we give her? Yeah, you're even frizomide. And there's no, like, spironolactone's here as well, but there's no point giving someone spironolactone if they've got so much fluid backed up that it's in their lungs and they can't breathe. So you can start people with frizomide, and then in the long term, you might switch to something weaker, like a spironolactone. Nice. Okay. Next, we've got Michael, six year old man who's turned up to his GP with some calf pain. So after he walks 100 meters, he has to sit down and he feels better. So, uh, on examination, you can't feel his dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial pulse on his right, and they're pretty crap on his left. So, what should we give him? All right, we'll just go through them. So, a tenolol is a beta blocker, likely to be useful. Not. Amiodarone, antiarrhythmic. Not. Spironolactone. Not. Rapamil. Nifedipine? Boy, okay. So it's, it's the statin. Because what does this guy have? Yeah, peripheral vascular disease. So you get peripheral vascular disease because your peripheral vessels are full of crap and usually it's atherosclerosis, um, which is fatty infiltration of your blood vessels. So you want to give someone something that will reduce the fat they've got going around. And so that's why you, you'll give them a statin. Okay, oh, we made a point about this as well. So which, which one of these gives you a reflex tachy? Yeah, just say it, say it again. Yeah, nifedipine. Um, and that's back to that picture that we had earlier. Um, it, this is why it is worth knowing a little bit about the mechanisms. Okay, so another murmur, 20 year old IV drug user, fatigue and fever. So, what does he have, firstly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, infective endocarditis. And so, pansystolic, fifth ICS, left lower sternal edge. So, it can only be one of two things. So, which one's it likely to be? All right, let's start with just which valve. Mitral. All right, so. Left side, fifth ICS, the one here. So mitral's over here. So here, it's tricuspid. Okay. And then it's a noise we're hearing during systole. So if it's a systolic problem, then which one does it have to be? Sorry? Okay. So it's regurg. Sorry. <laughs> and so oh, I've given you this, but it doesn't really help anyway. But the reason that it's regurg is because if you have a murmur 
through an atrioventricular valve during systole, that means that it must be opening back up while the heart is pumping. So it has to be going backwards through it. Yeah. If it was to be a stenosis, it would have to be through either pulmonary or aortic because it's got to be the blood going through something which is tightened during systole instead. <laughs> yeah, so the, re well, the reason there's a tricuspid as well, um, just as an aside, is because people, so obviously infective endocarditis. <laughs> nice. So. <laughs> Okay, so people who have infective endocarditis, um, this guy's got IV drug user, it's coming in through the skin, so that means that it's going to be coming in from the periphery. Coming in from the periphery, what's the first valve that you run into? <coughs> yeah, so that's why people with infective endocarditis tend to, I mean, you can get it everywhere else as well, but a very common one is tricuspid, just because it's the first one you run into. Okay, next, what else might you see in this guy? So this is where, like, paying attention in the clean skills shoot comes in handy when they tell you what each of the things in the hands are. Yeah, so, so there's three. So Janeway's one of them. Oz's nodes. What's the third one? Hmm? No. Okay so, okay, so we'll just go through what each of these are. So, um, so it's Roth spots is the third one. So, um, and that's just, it's in the eyes. Um, you can Google a picture of that. Conwall spots is more of like a diabetic thing. Uh, Oz's nodes, yes. Hebbidens nodes and Bouchard's nodes are osteoarthritis. Uh, and ecchymoses are just bruises. And perpura just small bruises. So, uh, yeah, just know the vocab, I guess. Okay, point three. Uh, which of these is the most common cause of this condition? If you don't know, yeah, always guess staph. It's staph aureus. <laughs> staph aureus causes everything, and it causes a lot of everything. Okay. So, remember when we talked about which parts of the heart are supplied by what? Does someone want to tell me what this shows? Just broadly. Yeah, I heard ST elevation, so it's a... It's a STEMI, okay. Can anyone tell me which part of the heart is affected? So you, if, you, if I gave you the options of like medial, lateral, anterior, inferior. Yeah, inferior. You can tell because you got lead two, lead three, and ABF. So all of these three leads are based on um, dots you put on the patient's legs and the patient's legs coming back up. So all of them are looking at the heart from below. So if you have elevation in 2-3 ABF, then it's going to be an inferior STEMI. So, which of these is the one blocked to do that? Just, just think about the big picture of the heart. Anyone have a <coughs> All right, well, it's the right coronary. And so if you have a look at this, if you, if you know it like this much, it's enough to tell you what's doing what. So right coronary wraps around down here like this, which is why it gives you inferior stemmies. If you get something that's more lateral, you think you're circumflex, something that's anterior, so that's like that one, two, three, four, five, six kind of distribution, then it's gonna be LAD. And that's it. Good luck, thanks for listening. Oh.